What are we discussing on today's Locked on Diamondbacks podcast? How the D-backs swept MLB's best team and why Arizona and the Philadelphia Phillies are going in opposite directions. You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown MLB. Use code all lowercase to lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. On today's Lockdown Dimebacks podcast, we'll be talking about the D back sweeping MLB's best team, two factors that have played into the D back's recent success, and how. Arizona and the Philadelphia Phillies are going in opposite directions. Thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do the I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. And one of those platforms is YouTube. Please hit subscribe to Locked On Diamondbacks on YouTube. Now let's get into the podcast and talk about that D-backs doubleheader and their sweep over the Cleveland Guardians because this was not just AL's best team. This was MLB's best team by record as the D-backs face off against Cleveland, but you wouldn't have known it because the D-backs really handled the Guardians in this series, took a convincing game one, and then a convincing doubleheader where I don't think they ever surrendered the lead in either game, and it was good good pitching and great offense that led to this D-backs victory. And now, all of a sudden, you look at the MLB standings, and the Dodgers have yet to play tonight. I'm recording this before the Dodgers-Phillies game. The D-backs only three and a half games back of the Dodgers. If the Dodge, if the Dodgers lose, of course, to Philly, they will only be three games back in the NL West. The standings are getting close, and the D-backs, they're on fire. They are on fire right now. They are playing some of their best baseball, and they are currently the owners of the top wildcard spot in the National League. So hard to believe the climb that the D-backs have been on since June 29th. That's where all this have started. And ever since then, the D-backs own every stat, own every record. The D-backs have been balling since then. And now they are sitting, what, 11 games above 500. They are 63 and 52 crazy to think about because we waited so long just for the D-backs to get like one game above 500, two games above 500. It was such a long road for Arizona back on June 30th, or you could even go back to June 29th entering June 29th. The the D-backs were three games below 500, excuse me, entering June 29th. The D-backs were four games below 500. They were 39 and 43 before winning and beating the Oakland A's on June 29th. 39-43, and 43, four games below 500. And since then, MLB's best record, and they are now 11 games above 500, and they just took it to MLB's best team by record. The starting pitching had a very good day against Cleveland. Brandon Fott got us started, really only had like, one inning where he gave us some concern in that fifth inning. Outside of that, Brandon Fott was nearly perfect against Cleveland. Pitched into the seventh. Had a good pitch count. Only 81 pitches through six and one-third innings pitch. He looked really comfortable on the mound. Locating his pitches. Really good command. Only one walk to six strikeouts. I thought Brandon Fott was fantastic in game number one for the D-backs. He's been a little bit, now I wouldn't say bad, but... Uh, a little bit more shaky in his most recent starts and his last couple starts. So this was a fantastic, really strong start for Fott against the MLB's best team. And Fott just continues to look like the D-backs best starter in the rotation 
And then, of course, we got the debut of Erod, and we said we knew he wasn't going to pitch a ton of pitches. We just want to see Erod lay the foundation, lay the groundwork for, you know what? He's going to be a good pitcher for the D-backs. We didn't need to have him go out there and have, you know, seven no-hit innings of only 50 pitches thrown. Like, we just want to see some momentum for Erod to build off, lay the groundwork where we're going to feel good about you going forward. He definitely did that. Was he elite? No, his velo was a little bit down, only topping out at 93. Like, everything wasn't there for Erod. He gave up a couple home runs, but even with that being said, three earned runs over five and two innings pitch with four hits allowed, that would be like a top three start for Monty this season. And so the fact that Erod did that in his debut makes me feel good about him going forward with Gallon, with Fott. Now we got Erod back in the mix and Merrill Kelly all of a sudden making rehab starts. We might not be that far away from seeing the full D-backs rotation, and it got me feeling giddy. D-backs also did a good job of displaying power in these two games against Cleveland. Six home runs in the double header. Let's name them off. Corbin Carroll, Ketel Marte, Gerardo Perdomo, Randall Gritchick, and two from Josh Bell. Corbin Carroll continues to heat up. Again, he's not getting consistent hits. He's not getting those multi-hit games, but you look at his numbers since June 29th, Corbin Carroll has over a 500 slugging. He's got triples. He's adding home runs. Maybe he's not getting, you know, three out of five games having multi-hit games, but he is at least providing a lot of extra base hits. And of course, when Corbin Carroll is getting on base, that's going to create chaos. All of a sudden, he now gets to run. So for Carroll, we're seeing a lot more doubles, triples, and home runs from him. And we love to see the fact that he started to tap into some power. Ketel Marte continues to crush it in the ninth inning. This past week and a half against the Pirates, against Cleveland, Ketel Marte had just been in Home run after home run in the ninth inning. And for a D-backs team that has been struggling with their closer and been struggling to close out games, one way you won't struggle is if you have massive leads in the ninth inning because Kevin Marte continues to mash and hit home runs. So he is making his MVP case. And honestly, if you go look at the numbers, it's getting dangerously close between him and the Otanis and the Marcel Azunas. And of course, those guys are DHs. So when you take into the account of Marte's defense and he's like 90% Otani offensively, yeah, Marte definitely deserves to be in that MVP conversation. Josh Bell, another two home run game. He has four home runs in six games now for the D-backs. He's basically been a nice facsimile of Christian Walker. Maybe the defense isn't as elite because Walker, of course, is the best defensive first baseman in the sport. But considering what Walker provides for the D-backs offensively, Josh Bell has been has been able to produce a very similar image of what Walker was doing with the D-backs, which is a ton of power. Bell has, it feels like every time Bell makes contact, it's loud, it's hard. Maybe it's not always a home run, but even the grounders feel like they're ripped every single time. So I think Bell has been like 90% of what Christian Walker has given us. This is a dude that gets traded every single trade deadline. So not surprised to see he goes to a new team and immediately starts making a good impact. Geraldo Perdomo, First home run of the year for him. He gets a silent treatment as he goes back to the clubhouse. A very fun moment. I actually just saw a graphic that showed you the most home runs for each franchise Each franchise for a guy in the number nine hole. The player who has the most home runs for the D-backs in their franchise history out the number nine hole is actually Carson Kelly with 10. I think one day Geraldo Perdomo, if he's an eight-year veteran with the D-backs, batting number nine every single day, I think he can definitely surplant Carson Kelly as the best number nine hitter in D-backs franchise history. Offense fantastic in the doubleheader. Like I said, never surrendered a lead. The bullpen was also very good outside of Dylan Floro, who did did not have his best outing, but the rest of the bullpen looked very shut down. Just Martinez, he was a little shaky in his save opportunity, but also at the same time, was elite like he has these moments where sometimes the command gets a little ari but when he locks back in he's filthy and so yes he got the bases loaded but also gave up no earned runs and it was the first time the d-backs had a save opportunity with no earned runs since july 26 justin martinez is my pick going forward to be 
the D-backs closer. And then finally, the last good thing, or not the last good thing, but another good thing that I want to talk about from this doubleheader, the defense. They made plays all day long. Carroll, Guriel, Suarez, Perdomo, up and down this team. Everyone was making defense plays, and it was a complete team effort. Offense, pitching, defense, all three phases. D-backs looked really good against Cleveland. The only things I can complain about, the D-backs were 3 for 15 with runners in scoring position on the day. Would like to see that improved. And Lords Guriel, he went hitless on the day, only played in game one. He's really the only everyday D-back that has not been good since June 29th. Literally, you name any D-back that's, you know, playing 80% of the time, they have been great. The D-backs have like nine guys, 10 guys with like a WRC plus of at least 100 since June 29th. Lords Guriel is not one of them. Would love to see him get cooking. Maybe he could get cooking in the next series, but I want to talk about two factors that have been really critical to the D-backs' recent success because we know the D-backs have been elite since June 29th. So I want to talk about two factors that have led to the D-backs' recent success since that date in segment number two. But hey, if you're looking to play daily fantasy sports, then I suggest Prize Picks because Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stats projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. Prize Picks is available in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code Locked On MLB on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Locked On Dimebacks podcast. Let me talk to you guys about two factors that have been really working for the D-backs since June 29th. And those two factors are defense and power. I'll first start with the defense because I think it's an area that we don't talk about enough on the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Because we know during the Toy Lovello era, that has been maybe the calling card of this D-backs team. Over the last few years, they have always if not been the best, one of the best defensive teams in the National League. It's something that they really care about. When they go into player evaluation, they will typically choose the defender with maybe minimal offense over the guy who has a great bat and no defensive upside. D-backs really value defense. And again, in this doubleheader, they made plays all day long. Yeah, Corbin Carroll with the outfield assist where he makes the little sliding grab. We know. Carroll doesn't have the strongest arm, but it was deadly accurate, and it was a shallow throw, so he was able to gun down the guy at home. Lords Goriel, he did himself a little barrel roll in the outfield. Thankfully, didn't get hurt. Maybe that's why he didn't play in game number two, but he was able to make a great defensive play that really helped the game uh, keep going because it felt like the game could have been a little bit tighter if Guriel didn't make that play. You had Eugenio Suarez and Geraldo, Do and Geraldo Perdomo making diving stops. Like The D-backs defensively were great in this doubleheader. And it's been one of the calling cards for this team all season long and especially since June 29th because you got Perdomo back during that time. You got Moreno back during that time. You really had your whole lineup. This D-backs defense, I think, has been cooking since then. And you look at this D-backs defense the whole season, and it has been really, really strong. And it's an area that I don't think we've talked enough about. I don't talk uh, enough about the D-backs defense. I've talked about how the offense has been the best since June 29th. I've talked about how the pitching has been a lot better since June 29th. But from day one, this D-backs defense has actually been really good. Or excuse me, let me take that back. Maybe not since day one, because I remember that first month, month and a half when the D-backs were struggling, we had Blaze Alexander always making, you know, weird defensive plays at shortstop, right? And then just all around, it felt like that kind of Blaze, Alex Blaze Alexander energy was infectious throughout the whole lineup where there would just be times where, 
You know, maybe someone just drop a routine fly ball or just make a mistake defensively that you typically wouldn't see one of your guys make. I think since then, I love Blaze Alexander, but since they've optioned him and gone away from him defensively, this d defense has been really, really strong. And if you look at the numbers from the entire season, Fangraphs loves this d defense, and it has been one of the identities of this team. Number one in double plays turned as a unit. Number one in ultimate zone rating outs above average and FRV. This D backs defense is elite. And when you look at the, the individuals that make up the defense Walker, almost number one in almost every defensive category for first baseman, which is not a surprise. If he comes back at a decent time where he doesn't miss too many games, uh, you know, if Christian Walker could still play, I don't know, 110 games, I would have to see the math, 120 games. He should still win the gold glove. There's not a better defensive first baseman than Christian Walker in the league. So hopefully he has enough games played for the committee to win that gold glove award. Ketel Marte, he's having himself a great defensive season. He's like top two, top three in almost every defensive stat for second baseman. Eugenio Suarez, the numbers... They don't always love him defensively, but the eye test, I think, tells you Suarez is a very good defender. He has the best arm I think I've ever seen for D-backs third baseman in recent history. I I feel like he makes that throw every single time. And the numbers still tell you he's not bad. He's like top five in almost every third base defensive category. So he is a good defensive third baseman. Domo and Newman both grayed out as good defenders. Gabriel Moreno still elite defensively. Maybe he's not the level he was last year, but he's still very strong defensively. And then the defense in the outfield is still considered solid, even without an Alec Thomas. Maybe not elite, but the Gurriels, McCarthy's, and Gritchicks all are considered solid. So when you look at this D-backs unit as a whole, defense has been the calling card for Torrey Lovello during his tenure. And once again this season, Defense has been so important for the D-backs. I think it's been one of their identities since June 29th. Then their other identity since June 29th is not something you would have applied to the D-backs last year. This is not a characteristic or a trait that they were able to do in 2023. Despite getting to the World Series, this was one of their weaknesses, and it's power. The D-backs last year were middle of the pack at best when it comes to home runs and just overall power. This season, D-backs are way better than that. And since June 29th, this is the best home run hitting team in Major League Baseball, which is crazy to think about because they were not that team last year. This was a team built on speed and chaos. And now they took that speed and chaos and have added power to this unit, which is crazy to think about. Most home runs in the National League since June 29th. They have three of the top 13 home run hitters during that time as well. Marte is third in home runs. Eugenio fifth. And Jock Peterson is 13th. D-backs displaying a ton of power. Now you got Josh Bell in the mix. Corbin Carroll starting to hit some home runs as well. This D-backs team did not have the power last year. Now that they have this year. Plus, they're still number one in sacrifice hits since June 29th, number one in sacrifice flies, and top five in steals. This is a team that can still do it via the small ball if they have to, but now they can also do it via the long ball. Every way an offense can go, the D-backs can slice you up now. Hitting ability, home run ability, chaos, speed, whatever you want, patience, whatever you want. The D-backs can do it all. This is a complete offense. I love the way they look, and they're going to have to keep it going in their next series against the Philadelphia Phillies. As the Phillies are a team that's struggling a little bit right now, and we'll actually talk about in segment number three how Arizona and Philadelphia are going in opposite directions. But hey, if you're looking for better hydration, then I suggest Liquid IV because when you're taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's Popsicle Firecracker flavor, a surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America because baseball and summer go together like Liquid IV and indulgent hydration. 
Pear Pour Live More. One stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. Powered by LIV Hydra Science, an optimized ratio of electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients that turn ordinary water into extraordinary hydration. Three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, eight essential vitamins and nutrients, always non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, and soy-free. No more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with liquid IV. I use it almost every day. I live in Arizona. Guys, we know it's the desert and it's 115 every single day. So you got to stay hydrated. That's why I keep a pack of Liquid IV on me wherever I go. And you can too. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast, and let's talk about how the D-backs and Phillies are going into two different directions, opposite directions, because I did have a recent listener comment on a YouTube video saying, Lockdown Phillies host Connor has been talking a lot of crap about the D-backs this season. I don't know why he's been doing that. The listener told me Connor has been looking down on the D-backs, actually, and that would have been fair until June 29th, because since that date, we know the D-backs have ascended. You look at the chart, the D-backs are going straight up. That little zigzag line going straight up. It's like a stock. (laughs) It's just on the rise right now. It's like Dogecoin during the pandemic. That's what the D-backs are right now. They are going to the moon. They're number one in almost every stat offensively. Runs, wins, home runs, average, OPS, WRC+. This D-backs offense is elite. The pitching has been really good. They have been crushing it since the 29th. But the Phillies have not. Since that date, the Phillies, they're going in the opposite direction. I can't, they're kind of like Dogecoin post-pandemic, where it just absolutely plummeted. That's where the Phillies have been since the 29th. They are 12 and 18 since that date. And in the second half of the season, post all-star break, the Philadelphia Phillies are five and 12. And that's their record before this game against the Dodgers. Of course, the offense has been really bad for Philadelphia since June 29th. And I don't know really why, but you take a look at the numbers for Philly and it is not looking good since that date. The Phillies are like, bottom 10 in a lot of different offensive categories since that date. You look at WRC plus the Phillies terrible, not good at all. They are currently, let me see. I have it pulled up here on fan graphs. All of a sudden my Wi-Fi wants to be really slow for me. Come on, come on Wi-Fi. I'm trying to show the people why the Phillies are so bad since June 29th. Okay, here we go. Since June 29th, the Phillies offense, 10th in WRC+. plus In terms of run scored, the Phillies are 12th in run scored since June 29th. You want to look at, I don't know, average? They're 7th, like middle of the pack. You look at slugging, they're 8th. Again, middle of the pack. The Phillies have been a bottom half team offensively since June 29th, which is kind of surprising when you think of all the money that they spent on that roster, all the talent that they have in their lineup, the fact that they have not been uh, good offensive contributors for a multi-week stretch now, it it should be concerning if you're a Philadelphia Phillies fan. That's an expensive team. That's an expensive roster. And now you have a five, six-week sample size where your offense had just not been very good. I think the main reason is because their catalyst for that offense has been struggling a lot. You look at the, the the Phillies players, a lot of them aren't bad since June 29th. That hasn't really been the problem. You actually look at the Phillies core guys since that date. Trey Turner has still been good, 130 WRC+. Plus. Castellanos, 121. Alec Baum, 132. Schwarber, 172. Like That's a core four of the Phillies guys uh, that have been really good since the 29th. That's, f- that, that's four of the five guys in their core. The one guy in their core that has not been good since that date is their MVP, their catalyst, Bryce Harper, who has fallen off a map 
since June 29th. A 193 average, a 268 OBP, and 85 WRC+. plus. I don't know what's happened to Bryce Harper since that date, but he has fallen off a cliff, and that's been a big reason why this Philadelphia Phillies offense has not been as good recently. And it's not just the offense. You also look at the pitching for the Phillies during that time, and it hasn't been that good either. They are 10th in starting pitching ERA, and they are dead last in bullpen ERA. They also give up the most home runs during that stretch as well. Both offense and pitching has been terrible for the Phillies since the 29th, and that's why it is such a good opportunity for the D-backs to play them at this point of the year. I think it's a pretty fun litmus test to see how both of these teams look because the last time these two teams faced off, the I don't think the D-backs were as good. Meanwhile, the Phillies were a lot better because, to be honest, you look at the last time these two teams faced off, June 21st to June 23rd, right before the D-backs took off and right before the Phillies went into the tank, these two teams played. And so it's a great opportunity to see these two teams match up against each other again. Last year, the D-backs had a great first half and then sucked in the second half. This year, it's flipped. D-backs now look like they will be riding a high going to the postseason. And maybe we'll have some good vibes going to the postseason because last year, the D-backs just scratched and clawed their way into the playoffs. I don't think that's going to happen this year. If the D-backs go out there and win this series against the Philadelphia Phillies, why can't we declare the D-backs the best team in baseball? I know they won't have the best record, but they will have the best record since June 29th if they go out there and beat the Phillies uh, this upcoming weekend. And then think about some of the opponents that they've been since the 29th, the Dodgers, the Padres, the Phillies, Cleveland, Kansas City. Like That is a nice litmus test of teams to beat so you can have a claim to being the best team in baseball. I think the the last team that they would have to beat to officially gain the title is the Red Sox later this month because you look at all the numbers and the stats. The Red Sox are basically the second best team in baseball since June 29th. That's what the numbers tell you. So if the D-backs can do that, I will officially call the D-backs the best team in baseball at that point of the season. But even with that being said, it's not going to be easy to beat the Phillies in this upcoming series. We know about the recent struggles I just laid out, but they're still going to have, you know, their rotation set up for this weekend series. We're going to see Zach Wheeler. We're going to see Aaron Ola, and we're going to see Christopher Sanchez. So the Phillies are going to be throwing out their top three starters in this series. So it's not going to be easy, but with the way the D-backs have been playing recently with their own offense or with their own pitching staff, with their defense, I'm taking them every single night. I'm going to FanDuel, and I'm placing a wager down. money line D-backs over Phillies every single game, and hopefully it nets me some money in my pocket. So, yes, the Phillies have their rotation set up for this weekend series, but considering how the D-backs, but considering how the D-backs are playing, I'm predicting the D-backs take three out of four in this upcoming weekend series. Now, that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Doses.